My name is Brent Sellers. I'm the Extension Waste Specialist here at the Range Cattle Research and Education Center and also serving as a director. And uh, I guess in my past life, before I became administrative, I started work, I was working on smut grass quite a bit. And what I wanted to do today was go through um, just some basic smut grass information that uh, we've acquired over the years and people actually, researchers before my time here at the center. And then go through some of the past experiments that we've been working on through my program uh, over the last uh, 14, 15 years, and then talk about some of our current and future experiments that are going on. So we have two species of smut grass in Florida. We generally refer to them as small and giant smut grass. Taxonomists and botanists argue about which um, genus and species that well, actually, which species they belong to. Uh, but for the grand scheme of things, the easiest way to tell them apart is by looking at the seed heads. Uh, the oppressed cylindrical spikes would be the small smut grass. And this species used to be the predominant species in the state. Uh, since the 90s, giant smut grass has become more prevalent in the southern part and it's slowly encroaching northward. So this is giant smut grass here on the right hand side of the picture. Control wise, uh, for a long time, we've been using Velpar. Uh, the active ingredient is hexazinone. There is a generic called Tide hexazinone, as well as a product named Velosa that's at a slightly different rate structure. It's more concentrated in the jug, so you'll be using less per acre on a volume basis. Uh, no surfactant is required. I'm gonna show some data on that in a little bit as well, at least from the foliar standpoint. And uh, when I first started with Vel working at UF, Velpar had a 60-day grazing restriction. That has since been reduced to zero, but there is still a 38-day haying restriction if you're using this in Bermuda grass or Bahia grass up in the northern part of the state. So what was one of the first projects that was looked at? And this is actually back in 1955 when this work was done uh, by Michaela and Hodges and Kirk, uh, some of the first uh, faculty members here at the center. And of course, there are very limited herbicides at that time. So they looked at the impact of mowing and uh, they mowed it weekly, bi-weekly, every three weeks or every four weeks. And one, this chart here on the left shows a number of plants per 100 linear feet. The chart on the right shows a base of width in inches. And uh, basically the take home from this is mowing doesn't really do much to the density uh, of the plants, but it does reduce the basal width of the plants, <clears throat> especially when you're mowing it weekly. Every four weeks, not so much, but mowing it weekly or bi-weekly, you definitely start to reduce the basal width of those plants. Long term, um, the researchers felt that this really wasn't that beneficial because they're probably increasing seed spread with these plants producing somewhere between 35 and 45,000 seeds per plant. You have potential for a lot of seed spread. After mowing, the next uh, herbicide that came about was one called Dalpon, the active ingredient of Dalapon. Um, a lot of people want that herbicide back, but if you look back at the literature and start really investigating how that herbicide worked for us, it may, may have been more consistent than hexazinone. However, it produced a, resulted in a lot more injury on our desirable forages than hexazinone does, even though hexazinone does produce a little bit of injury from time to time. Uh, today as well. So one of the first experiments uh, that I worked on uh, with my first master's student, Barton Wilder and Jay Farrell, a colleague of mine in Gainesville, was looking at uh, how different rates of hexazinone worked on small and giant smut grass. And what I'm showing here is data on small smut grass. And we didn't approach 90% control until we got around or, or above a pound per acre of, of hexazinone. So this is equivalent to two quarts per acre. Um, but what I wanted to point out on this graph is the error bars surrounding these data points see a wide amount of variation at a half pound per acre. 
So you can end up with 20% control or upwards of 80% control. And that's something that we still see today. And as, um, as we'll see in a little bit, very dependent on environmental conditions uh, to get 80% control. But by and far, just to summarize the rate titration data, um, basically we found that both species, we're gonna recommend around a pound of the acre, two quarts per acre of hexazinone. That was going to be our best strategy mo moving forward. The other project we looked at at that time was looking at different surfactants. And this was to look, hopefully increase the foliar uptake of hexazinone. <clears throat> and uh, we looked at different rates of a product named Optima and several other different surfactants. Conducted this uh, three years with uh, hexazinone at three or four pints per acre, so one and a half or two quarts per acre, and those different rates and different types of surfactants. And the quick take home on this project was that it really didn't matter. Optima rates, they all responded the same. And basically we figured out that no surfactant <clears throat> resulted in similar levels of control as anything with a surfactant, which makes sense because we've said that most of the activity from this product comes through root uptake. So the surfactant really isn't gonna bring that much to the, to the game and uh, it's just going to add more cost to an already expensive herbicide. All right, so if we go back, if we think about that rate titration slide, and I showed focused on those error bars to show the variation. Um, we, we were trying to figure out ways to overcome some of that variation. One of those ways was to look at sequential annual applications of hexazinone and compare that with renovation or a fall tillage operation. So that was what we started out doing back in 2008. And I'll set this up for you. Uh, in 2008, we went into the pasture and separated into plot blocks where we had Velpar at two quarts per acre. And we renovated one portion at uh, four quarts per acre using glyphosate at four quarts per acre. And then our last uh, treatment was fall roller chopping. At the beginning of the experiment, we had about three plants per square meter. And then after that first treatment, we reduced um, smut grass to less than half a plant per square meter with a Velpar application or the fall roller chopping. But when we renovated, we nearly doubled our smut grass population in that pasture. So <clears throat> that was kind of shocking to us. We weren't expecting the population to double where we, went, where we renovated. Uh, that pasture, but we went back over these plots across all the treatments with one quart per acre. And then in 2010, we see a, a reduction in all the plots to less than a quarter of plant per square meter. All right, so a couple take homes from this trial uh, was that sequential applications actually worked pretty well. Uh, we're going to be talking about hexazinone. Fall roller chopping actually surprised us too. We weren't expecting uh, that amount of reduction in smut grass uh, just from a fall roller chopping event. However, that fall and winter was extremely dry. So roller chopping may have exposed the roots and dried out those smut grass clumps, uh, resulting in the decline of the population. The other take home is if you do decide to renovate a pasture, um, it's very important that you don't just renovate and walk away. It's important that you come back a year after uh, seeding and apply at least a quart per acre of Velpar or hexazinone, uh, and maybe even a year after that. As you see, by 2011, it's already rapidly increasing, um, even though there's not much statistical difference in the glyphosate or the renovated plots. So you may have to do that for a couple of years after uh, renovating just to ensure that you don't get the amount of smut grass coming back in those plots. Another trial we looked at was sequential um, applications with and without nitrogen fertilizer. And uh, we started out with two plants per square meter. When we started the study, applied two quarts per acre in 2008. 
came back in 2009 and counted the plants and we basically almost knocked them completely out uh, with that single application. Uh, so we didn't really see a lot of advantage uh, to applying Velpar with nitrogen uh, from this study. Not to say that it's not going to happen. Um, and just to be clear that this nitrogen was applied as a broadcast uh, granule, not with the herbicide. So th these were separate applications. Uh, but long term, if we could have carried this out another couple of years. It would have been interesting to see if we continued to get more smut grass in these plots that received no Velpar or no nitrogen. However, we didn't look at that. The last sequential study we looked at was looking at Velpar at various rates in year one, followed by various rates in year two. And basically within two years after the second application, we see that a quart followed by a quart is equivalent to two quarts followed by nothing. Uh, so that was kind of encouraging, uh, basically because if you end up with the same level of control of a quart followed by quart versus two followed by nothing, and you end up with a very extensive rainfall event, um, you've only lost 40 bucks an acre versus uh, I'm sorry, you've only lost 20 bucks an acre versus 80, 40 bucks an acre uh, within a single season. Of course, you up the rates, you end up with longer term control, and that's what we see in the orange color, especially at 36 months after treatment. A quart followed by quart and two quarts followed by nothing. We're looking at 20 plants per plot, and these were 20 foot by 20 foot plots. Um, <clears throat> versus less than 10 plants when you had at least a quart followed by at least a quart and a half or a quart and a half followed by a, a quart or higher the following year. So at that point in time, um, we were recommending that two-year programs are better than one year and walking away. And the renovation needs to occur uh, when greater than 70% of the pasture is infested but you have to follow it with a herbicide application one year after planting. Of course, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is hexazinone is lethal to oaks. So that's something that you need to be paying attention to. And rainfall is necessary because you need it to get the herbicide into the soil solution, but too much is also bad. So our next project started actually looking at how rainfall impacts Velpar activity in smut grass. And we started it off in the greenhouse. This is uh, two quarts per acre in the greenhouse uh, applied <clears throat> on the same day that we simulated rainfall and we simulated rainfall from zero all the way up to eight inches. And our greenhouse results told us quarter of an inch up to an inch results in a nearly complete kill. You get above an inch in the greenhouse, you start losing activity and almost no results on the um, smut grass from the hexazinone. Well, control, control conditions are one thing when you actually go out into the field, it tells a different story. And um, this is uh, Jose Diaz, who was one of my PhD students. He went out every Friday and applied uh, <clears throat> hexazinone at uh, one and two quarts per acre. And then we measured rainfall for seven days after each application. And that's what I'm gonna show you next. So we have control on the y-axis on the left. We have the amount of rainfall in inches on the right y-axis and the application dates uh, across the bottom. And the rainfall again is just a seven day period after application. So a couple of things I wanted to point out. Um, when you look at June 3rd, where we had over five inches of rainfall within a seven day period, Following two quarts per acre of hexazinone, we only ended up with 50% control. And then July 1st, where we had no rainfall for seven day period, again, only 50% control. Less than a quarter of an inch, we ended up with uh, just around 65% control on July 29th. But by and far, we did this uh, two more years. So we have data from 2017 and 2018 as well. And in general, if you received at least a quarter of an inch and no more than three and a quarter inches of rainfall within seven days, um, 
hexazinone activity or smut grass control tend to be pretty good. Uh, there were exceptions from time to time. It's something we're going to have to dive into the data, the rainfall data a little bit to see when those events actually happened <clears throat> in that seven day period. But by and far, if you end up with somewhere between a quarter of an inch and three, three inches, just over three inches of rainfall within seven days, typically you're going to end up with pretty decent um, smut grass control. One thing I haven't talked about too much, I've basically focused on Bahia grass and Bermuda grass. Um, I haven't shared very much on what this can be used on other than those two on those two uh, forages. Uh, but basically we've determined that we shouldn't be using hexazinone on lymphograss, grass, star grass, or mulatto. Um, Limpo grass, it's really iffy and I haven't come up with or haven't figured out why sometimes we get a very significant response on the lymphograss with hexazinone. Other times we barely see none. And the best thing I've come up with so far in lymphograss is that if it is fertilized and actively growing, you're more likely going to see injury from the hexazinone than if it were not fertilized and not grazed or not mowed within the last four months. If it's been fertilized, mowed, or grazed in the last four months, we tend to see a lot more injury. So <clears throat> one of the other things we tried to do besides hexazinone is look at alternatives. And one of those alternatives is obviously glyphosate. Um, it's not something that's for the weak-minded by any means because everybody knows that glyphosate is non-selective. It can <clears throat> reduce our forage availability from time to time but a lot of our forage grasses are pretty resilient to glyphosate as well. So we decided to look at this. Uh, we have two different locations. One's at Brighton, one is at Home Sound. Uh, at the Brighton location, we only looked at four different rates of glyphosate from four to 32 ounces uh, per acre. And this is going to be the 41% glyphosate or the three pound acid equivalent glyphosate products. And what we're doing here is looking at seed head production and numbers per square meter. And you get at 15 and 30 days after treatment, you get above eight ounces. You're looking about 80 to 90%, if not 100% of control of seed head production. So if we can reduce the amount of seeds that's being produced uh, by smut grass, we're going to be in, moving in the right direction. Pope Sound, we looked at many more rates, um, but I'm going to focus on the 16 ounce per acre rate. Again, this is a 41% solution. This is at 15, 30, and 60 days after treatment. And again, we're looking at uh, 85 to 90% reduction at 15 and 30 days, <clears throat> and probably about an 80% reduction by 60 days in the amount of seed heads that's being produced. So just some pictures from this trial as well. Uh, 30 days after treatment, you see the untreated significant amount of seed heads being produced. This is almost 100% smut grass at this location. Uh, definitely over the pictures, four ounces and eight ounces, you see a reduction in the number of seed heads that are showing up. And actually, so a lot of necrosis or brownout uh, from 16 and 32 ounces on the smut grass. And that was at Brighton at 30 days after treatment. Hope sound looks tremendously different, especially at the 16 and 32 ounce per acre rate. Uh, but we do see, you know, seed heads being produced in the entry and the four ounce per acre rate, and not so much at the eight, 16 and 32 ounce per acre rates. And, but the question is, why did we not see the response at Hope Sound that we saw at Brighton with regards to the brownout and necrosis? And uh, this was actually, I believe, due to the amount of standing water at the site when we made the application. Actually, it was dry at the application, but the site became flooded a week after. So I think that's one of the reasons we didn't see the same level of kill that we saw, but seeing the amount of seed head re reduction is, is very promising uh, for that treatment. Now, what about the grass response to glyphosate? All right, so if we focus on the 16 ounce per acre rate here, we're looking somewhere between uh, 75 to 82% reduction by 30 days 
Uh, but when you go out 60 days after treatment, we're only looking at about a 20% reduction in Behagras biomass. So short term, yes, it looks pretty nasty. Um, but long term, it does grow out of it and Behagras becomes productive again. Now, one of the other ways we can use glyphosate and hexazinone is through a wiper. And this is something that uh, Jose Diaz also worked on during his uh, doctorate here at the center. And I'm just going to summarize, he had four different locations where he looked at a lot of this. And the big take home from this is bidirectional. So wiping the smut grass in two directions versus one direction. That's glyphosate at 70%, hexazinone at 30 or 60% were the most effective. And that was regardless of being, um, sorry, that was when plants were not mowed for the most part. When we mowed, uh, because we did most of this um, during the growing season, we did not end up what, with much of a height differential between smut grass and our desirable forage. So we didn't end up with a good level of control um, on the smut grass that day during those trials. So if we're gonna use a wiper, we have a few uh, recommendations. Uh, if height differential is not present, like if you have mode or have not been able to graze, so you don't have much of a height differential, hexazinone may be your best product at 30% volume to volume. If height differential is significant, glyphosate can be used, but your concentration may need to be up to 35% volume to volume. That's especially if you have little or little experience with using a wiper. If you've been using a wiper for a while and you're pretty used to it, a lot of growers and applicators have reduced that concentration down to 10%. In general, I don't like to see people mow prior to using a wiper uh, unless we're talking during the dry season or during the early growing season when our desirable forages aren't growing that rapidly. Otherwise, you're not going to have the height differential, especially during the growing season. If you're doing the growing season, I would suggest overgrazing the pasture to get the height differential between the smut grass and the desirable forage. Very important that you wipe plants in opposite directions. I think almost every herbicide treatment we've, for concentration we've tried, except for one at one location, there is no positive response from wiping in one direction. And I've said this a lot as well. There's more art than science to using a wiper. It really comes down to experience, uh, keeping the wiper wet, and making sure you're getting enough product on the plants is very essential. Okay, more recent work that we've been working on is using liquid urea ammonium nitrate or UAN as a carrier. We did this at two locations near the center, and basically we used hexazinone at one and two quarts per acre with and without 32% UAN. Uh, just so everybody knows, we're applying about 30 gallons per acre, and at this uh, calibration, this ends up being about half um, water and half 32% UAN plus the herbicide. For control, we did uh, visual estimates control, and then we also did plant counts at zero and 60 days after treatment. And visually, we assessed the hexazinone uh, at one quart per acre without any nitrogen to on only be about 63, 64%. But when we added the nitrogen, we did get a, an increase up to around 87, 88% control. At two quarts per acre, we really didn't see an advantage to adding the nitrogen, and that's pretty typical. Um, uh, with the one quart per acre, we don't tend to get usually much over 60% control, but adding the nitrogen tends to help that in that regard. So that's visual estimates. We actually went out and counted plants that were still living. We were actually dig, dig down into the clumps, and we determined that uh, the control without nitrogen is actually probably closer to 30% uh, 
uh, versus 65% uh, or so with the nitrogen as a carrier. And we even see a sl slight but non-significant increase by adding the nitrogen uh, to the two quarts per acre rate. And then just some pictures from this trial. We have one quart per acre in water. You see a lot of green tissue uh, in this plot versus two quarts per acre in water. And then one quart per acre in nitrogen looks very similar uh, to the pictures next to it with two quarts per acre with water or nitrogen. We also looked at impregnating dry fertilizer with hexazinone at one to two quarts per acre. Um, this is something that we've tried. I've not been overwhelmingly satisfied with the progress from using uh, this, especially with the fertilizer we're using. If you end up getting some prill fertilizer, it may work a little bit better, but I tend to have too many fines in this fertilizer, so you didn't end up with a spread across the entire plot. So I'm gonna to try to show that in these pictures. You have a broadcast, sorry, this is supposed to be two quarts per acre, uh, broadcast uh, application in water versus a, a quart and two quarts per acre impregnated on dry fertilizer. And you can see very dead in the center of the plot, but as you get to the edges of the plot, there's about five feet on each side of the plot that did not get coverage uh, from the impregnated fertilizer just because it was too heavy and it wouldn't spread appropriately. All right, so smutgrass management today. Um, I think this is where we're at. Hexazinone, one and a half to two quarts per acre, sequential applications I think are a must. It needs to be applied during the rainy season for optimum control but there's still going to be a lot of variability because we can't predict how much rainfall is going to occur within that seven day window after application, but we can use some knowledge uh, based on previous weather patterns, or if you know a hurricane is potentially a tropical depression's coming, probably not a time that you want to apply Belpar. Uh, glyphosate at 16 ounces per acre for the three pound acid equivalent formulations, that's also a lot of times referred to as 41% glyphosate. Um, 16 ounces. If you end up using some of the newer formulations, uh, our county agents can help you uh, with those calculations. Uh, usually, uh, like Roundup PowerMax 2 with the 4.5 acid equivalent, it's about two thirds of that rate, so it should be around 11 ounces per acre. This is very effective for f post clipping and Bermuda grass and star grass. So, give the smut grass about a week to to start growing after it's been cut for hay. And this is one of the treatments that's been working pretty well. And I think prevention. Uh, cleaning mow equipment between pastures, I think is something that is very instrumental in helping keep smut grass out. But also when you see smut grass starting to come into a pasture, spot treatment is very effective. Like I said, um, normally we don't recommend renovation until you're upwards of 70% uh, smut grass cover, but there are uh, other places where sometimes 30% smut grass cover needs renovation too. So it's something we'll have to talk about uh, for your specific situations. So what's the future hold? Well, um, we're going to expand on using look at UA UAN as a carrier, look at different timing and at different rates. Um, with the increase of herbicides and nitrogen over the past year, I think we need to look at lower rates, see if we can end up with the same level of control, but also look at timing. Uh, some of the commercial applications that have gone out in the past year have gone out really early, uh, much earlier than I would usually recommend and have ended up with decent activity. So that's something that we need to look at and get some data on. Uh, use of soil surfactants, something that I've not talked about very much in the past because uh, generally I don't have a lot of faith in them, but they have some newer technologies that are out today uh, that help keep the herbicides near the soil surface instead of leaching below the root zone. So that's something that we're also going to be looking at. 
And then we have a relatively new herbicide to the pasture market called Resilon that we're also seeing some pretty good activity on seedling smut grass, actually preventing that from emerging and taking root. Uh, but um, to my knowledge, that's not yet being sold in Florida, although it is labeled in Florida. Another thing I want to talk about briefly was biological control. And this isn't something that was on purpose. This is something that was found. Um, if you are an entomologist that you might recognize that these are actually chinch bugs. Uh, this was found in Big Cypress Reservation a few years ago. And basically what we're finding is these big areas of smut grass that have died. And when you go out to the surrounding plants or around those dead areas, we're finding chinch bugs on those. The chinch bugs seem to be moving northward. So we're asking that if you come across a situation where you have smut grass that's dying on its own without a herbicide application, uh, to please contact your county agent because we want to document how far north this has been moving over the last five or six years. So I'm almost finished. So if you have questions, please uh, put them in the questions uh, box. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Florida Cattle Enhancement Board. They have funded the rainfall studies that Jose worked on, as well as the current studies that we're working on with Liquid UAN, as well as the soil surfactants. And I'd also like to recognize the past students uh, that worked on a lot of this research that were presented today. Um, there's much more that's, that they've worked on that um, we need to cover, I think would be very interesting to a lot of you. And I'm going to leave you with this last slide that was from a colleague of mine in Australia that basically says a recurring theme is the importance of a competitive, well-managed pasture to minimize gaps within the pasture throughout the year, preventing giant rat's tail grass, which is equivalent of bar smut grass, seedling establishment from a long-lived soil seed bank. Without a vigorous competitive pasture being present, any attempt to control giant rat tails grass will be futile. I thought that was a really good quote uh, coming from Wayne Vogler in Australia. And I think it's true today. I talked about prevention and that's one of the way to keep smut grass out is if you have a good forage stand, it's not gonna completely prevent it, but it's going to help us decrease the spread overall. Okay, so I will open it up for questions. Um, I have one question already online. And it says, was the roller chopping repeated or only once in 2008? And that was back on the study where we looked at renovation versus roller chopping versus a sequential uh, Velpar application. And it was only one roller chopper treatment, one fall treatment. Okay, another question is, I'm thinking about how fast I see it spreading in some fields across the South. Do we have an idea of how fast percent smut grass spreads in the field annually? That's a really good question. I don't know that anybody's ever answered that. Um, a lot of times, if I can put, maybe put it in a different perspective, if we spray it in year one, we get 90% control and we don't go back for year two, three, four. By year four and five, a lot of times you're back to your original density. So didn't really answer your question per se, but it doesn't take long if you don't do anything. All right, I don't see any other questions, but if you do end up with some, please feel free to reach out uh, to us at the center or reach out to one of your county agents and we will get your questions answered. Thank you and have a good day. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Um, we hope you can come back on February the 8th to join us for a special webinar with guest speaker Colleen Larson. Colleen is a regional dairy extension agent in Okeechobee, and she will be presenting the slick gene in Holstein cattle improves thermo tolerance. And I will share the information for how to register for that whenever I send you these recordings from today. 
This Thursday, we have the 39th Annual Florida Cattlemen's Institute and Allied Trade Show. That's gonna be taking place at the Highlands County Fairgrounds in the Cattlemen's Building and Sale Arena. It's an afternoon program beginning at 12.30 and ending at six. And as you see here, this is the final agenda. The only change that has occurred that I'm aware of is Dr. Engel is not gonna be able to be in attendance. So in his place, Dr. Andre Johnson, Dean and Director for Extension is going to provide the UF IFAS update. There is no cost to attend this program. Registration is not required. So I hope you can make it for that. Here are three events to watch for this year. March 10th is gonna be the rescheduled forage management tour and workshop that was previously planned for, I believe, last fall. It's gonna be held at Mudge Ranch in LaBelle. On May 4th through 6th is going to be the 71st annual UF Beef Cattle Short Course. And that's going to be an in-person program at the Strawn Professional Development Center in Gainesville. And then on the third, oh, then we're gonna have the 13th annual UF IFAS Range Cattle REC Youth Field Day. And that event is gonna be held on June 30th here at the center. So if you're not already doing so, please consider following us on social media. We are on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and you can also check us out on our website. And if you don't already get our Friday news blasts, um, which are sent out every Friday, has information on events that are very soon, um, upcoming events, things that have happened here at the center, and just newsy bits that you'll want to know about, you can send us an email at ona at ifas .ufl.edu, and I will add you to our email list. Again, thank you so much for joining us for today's ONA highlight, and we hope to see you in February.